Hi there. Welcome to our Easter weekend edition of Jamaica Magazine. We are so happy you've joined us. I'm your host, Adrian Atkinson, piloting you through another informative half-hour journey. The COVID-19 pandemic is still raging, but it is hoped that the current lockdown will help to slow down its spread. If we're going to be a part of the solution, then we have to first learn about the virus. So today, we're doing just to that. We'll also have our Western Roundup segment, plus a look at how nature celebrates Easter with a poi plant in full bloom. Stick with us for these and much more right after this important message. Jamaica, we are in the throes of a pandemic. COVID-19 cases are on the rise. COVID-19 related deaths are climbing. COVID-19 bed capacity at our hospitals has been maxed out. Yet still, some of us continue to flout the COVID-19 containment measures. Some of us still refuse to wear masks in public places. We still gather in groups of more than 10. We still break the curfew hours and we still attend illegal parties. Wise up, take responsibility for your health. Safeguard the health of your loved ones. Obey the COVID-19 protocols. Hi, this week on Western Roundup, we give an update on the COVID-19 vaccination program in St. Elizabeth. And then we head to the streets of Montego Bay to hear what residents are saying about the recent announcements made by Prime Minister Andrew Holness in his budget debate about the proposed infrastructural developments for St. James. As usual, it will be good, so stay with us. The Public Health Department in St. Elizabeth continues to work in earnest as they continue to roll out their COVID-19 vaccination program. In terms of re responses and reaction from the persons who have been vaccinated in the parish, in the region so far, very good, very good responses. Persons are embracing the vaccine, they believe in it, and also they have embraced how the staff dealt with them. So I'm very pleased in terms of the response is a reaction from the persons who have actually gotten the vaccines. And they're talking from out the staff when they started vaccinating the staff, healthcare workers, and now we're moving to the elderly. So far, the team at the Southern Regional Health Authority has exceeded its vaccination target and hopes to continue on this trajectory, a feat the health minister is commending. We are at Balaclava Health Centre in St. Elizabeth and um, just here to observe the the um, vaccination program been through a number of parishes now in the St. Elizabeth Belt and so far so good. Uh, the team has been working, the place is well organized, um, nice process flow and uh, it seems to have gone smoothly in the six locations that have been set up in the parish. So uh, more will be done in the days to come but so far I think so good. Persons to be vaccinated are being reminded to visit the ministry's website at www.moh.gov.jm or call 888-1LOVE, that's 888-663-5683 to make their appointment, which are both time and location specific. Meanwhile, the recent announcement by Prime Minister Andrew Holness of planned infrastructural development for Montego Bay St. James is being greeted by stakeholders in the tourism capital as a step in the right direction. Taxi drivers, waitresses, business owners, you name it. The consensus is that Montego Bay is definitely in need of the infrastructural upgrade, especially the bypass road, which will seek to alleviate the city's traffic congestion problem. I think it's an excellent move as it's helped to emulate the traffic and also whenever time is rain, we have a hard time to go home from point A to point B. I think the bypass is well overdue and needed. We all understand that during the pandemic things have taken a turn for, I wouldn't say for the worst, but they've been taking a longer time to be done. But when that bypass is created, it's going to allow a lot of free flowing traffic from Port Cheerios, Portland, all the way down the south coast. People from the Elegant Corridor can roam up and down on, on their floors and not have to go through a two and a half hour traffic delay. 
in the city of Montego Bay? Would be tremendously good for us. Um, because you know we work and then the Asseline to take taxi to come to work would be easier for us to take a taxi and to go and to go home in the night or in the evening time. Very excited. It will help to alleviate traffic. Uh, the town tends to be congested, especially when it rains and there are flooded roads. Uh, especially operating a business, you have staff who live in neighboring parishes and with the bypass they will get home quicker and probably more safely especially if there are any natural disasters or hazards on the road. The Montego Bay Bypass will involve the construction of a 25 kilometers of roadway that will consist of two segments, a 15 kilometer Montego Bay Bypass starting from Ironshore to Bogue and the Long Hill Bypass involving construction of 10 kilometers of highway from Montego Bay to Mount Pelier. Other projects to be undertaken include a drainage study, which will be undertaken for the Montego Bay Parameter Road as part of the road improvement project to correct perennial flooding. And that's where we end today, and we are happy you stayed with us. As usual, thanks for watching Western Roundup where we take you from the corners of St. Elizabeth to the hilly terrains of St. Anne. Until next time, send us your feedback to jismobe at jis.gov.jm. Stay safe. The numbers keep climbing, and yet, some of you are still complaining about curfew times. Is that being selfish or are you being smart? You continue to blame the government, stating they are not doing enough. But the big question is, are you doing your part to help decrease the spread? The unfortunate reality is that far too many people refuse to take the coronavirus pandemic seriously until they or someone they love gets infected. Now, this is what we do not want. And I don't believe I can stress this enough. Wear your mask, sanitize. Of course, we love to hug and socialize, but just ease off some of that right now. Not just for your safety, but also for others. It looks hard for your relatives to be home doing all they need to in order not to catch the virus and you out on the road being reckless and carrying it right home to them. Each one of us needs to help during this fight against COVID-19 as we work to make Jamaica the place of choice to live, work, raise families and do business in a healthy environment. There have been misinformation and conspiracy theories around the coronavirus disease and the vaccines developed to bring it under control. You deserve to know the truth, factual information on these issues. So coming up next, we'll hear answers to the questions you might have from all reliable source of experts about COVID-19 and the vaccines. After you get your first dose, it takes a few weeks, about three or four weeks, before your body has produced sufficient protection to reduce your risk of COVID. So if you get exposed in the week or the second week after your first dose, you could still get COVID. But once you've had four, three to four weeks after the first dose, the risk of getting COVID is much, much less. After you get the second dose, seven days after the second dose, you are fully protected. And therefore, it is rare to get COVID after you have two doses. We already know it lasts several months, but we don't know how long it will last. For instance, the flu vaccine often lasts only a year. You have to then get another flu vaccine the following year. We are hoping that the COVID vaccine will last longer than that. Maybe you will need a booster in a year or two years or three years. That is still to be determined. But we do know that the vaccine is good, so we are optimistic that it will give you protection for a good while.
if someone is sick with COVID currently, then we do not advise them to take the vaccine while they're ill. After they recover, they are going to develop immunity and protection to getting infected again. So usually we say, wait four to six months since we know that people will have immunity for at least six months. So we say, allow someone else, since there's such a problem with the number of doses available, allow someone else to get vaccinated and they could wait four to six months. But if they have recovered and they do take the vaccine, no harm will come to them. In fact, that will act as a booster to their immune system. So they will have, they'll be even more protected than before. Someone with lupus should get the vaccine because that's someone with a comorbidity. If they get COVID, they're at risk of having more serious attack of COVID. So as long as they're not having an acute flare-up, then they should get the vaccine. If they're having an acute flare-up of their lupus, as soon as it is controlled, is reasonably controlled, they should get the vaccine. You have a comorbidity, then therefore you are definitely on our priority listing. So I want to encourage you to continue to build your immune system, eat right, certainly get some sun in the day, a lot of sleep, so that when it's your turn, your system will be ready to accept the vaccine. Thank you. It is a conversation to be had with your physician as to your current robust status. So if you are well, you are not having a flare at this time, then yes, you ought to take the vaccine. It's absolutely critical that we receive the vaccines. You will see hospitalizations and indeed deaths likely come down. And so there is a lot of value to be gained by getting as many vulnerables on board as possible. So tell your mothers, tell your aunts, listen out for yourselves if you're over 60 and take the vax because the vax is what will help you to guard against the COVID virus and indeed help your relatives, your friends, those who you come in contact with for the same benefit. There is still more we want you to know about COVID-19 and the vaccine, so let's get more of your questions answered right now. AstraZeneca vaccine at this time is being offered to pregnant and lactating women in the healthcare sector. So if you're a healthcare provider, then that's the recommendation. But we need to explain that just a bit. So in clinical trials, pregnant women as well as children are not usually looked at at all. It is until vaccines and other medications have passed through the phases and is now in the general population where thousands of persons get the medication that we then turn our attention to looking at trials in children and pregnant women. So we don't have a lot of data, but what we do know is the characteristics of this vaccine that we're talking about. It's non-replicating, which means that this vaccine will not cross over into the placenta and therefore the fetus is protected. This vaccine will also not get into breast milk and therefore the baby is protected from getting any ill effect 
of the vaccine. So we have the science of the vaccine that it is safe. And we also now know that healthcare workers in the age, the reproductive age range, if they get the disease, they do so much worse. Not only do they do themselves do badly, but they tend to have premature babies. So when you look at that risk benefit, then the risk of getting the vaccine, because it is safe, we know it's not getting into the uh, placenta, not going into breast milk, and we look at the impact of the disease on these very exposed persons, then we adhere to the recommendation of the strategic advisory group that healthcare workers should be offered. But as we get more information, then the vaccine may be offered to the entire population, uh, the entire pregnant and lactating population, but not at this time. The issue of mentally ill persons has been very high on our agenda as not just mentally ill but also the homeless. So we have been making contact with the agencies who um, know where these people are and who they trust because there's a trust issue here. So there are some agencies, Salvation Army, that feed them. There's National Council for Drug Abuse that has surveys. So they are, whereas we cannot say exactly how they are going to be done, they have certainly factored into the conversation. And the issue of seniors who are unable for various reasons, and there's two groups. There's those that are physically impaired, um, and there are also those that are mentally impaired that would be very disruptive staying within a center. And we have given consideration so persons will stay in a car and somebody will go out to them. But they, you see, we have to do the observation. We have to do all of the other things that everybody has spoken to. But yes, so these things are being taken into consideration as we seek to vaccinate. will take the vaccine when you get your appointment and you will take your medications at the time that you normally do. Most people take it in the morning, certainly after breakfast or something, but you do have people that take it in the evening. So stick to your regular regime for your medications and keep your appointment for your vaccine. You can take it at any time, but there's another concern with older population. A lot of the medications, especially the hypertensive medications, send you to the bathroom. And a lot of older people do not take their medication when they're going out, whether it's to the health center and to get a vaccine. It will be okay if you don't take your medication because that's your normal practice, because you don't want to get caught on the bus or something. But take it as you would when you come home. I doubt it very much. We, I don't think that has been tested. Thousands of women have already got the vaccine and we have seen no ill effect at all. And we are confident that over time, as we get more experience, because some women who have got the vaccine are, are now pregnant and they're being followed, we are confident that the vaccine will probably be safe even among pregnant women as well. The vaccine will protect you from severe illness, possible hospitalization and even death. And that is why we go right back to our IPC measures because your family need to also remain in their bubble that is safe and you will need to continue wearing your mask so will everybody in the family uh, do the hand wash thing sanitize and physical distance as appropriate we're not vaccinating children no we're not because they weren't a part of the clinical trials so as we vaccinate older persons with comorbid conditions we have to continue to preach the message to our children, to our younger persons. We've got to wear our masks. We've got to do the hand wash 
and we've got to physically distance until, until, until we have vaccinated enough persons in the population so that we have attained uh, herd immunity. The Ministry of Health and Wellness held its first large-scale vaccination operation, dubbed the Blitz, at the National Arena on Saturday. We now hear from some of the over 600 persons who got their first dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine on the day. My name is Norma Bengiat and I just had the vaccine, it just a little stick, really nothing at all. And um, the, the whole situation here has been very, very good, very well organized. I was so happy when I heard persons in my age group were able to get it because I think it's very important that we should protect ourselves against the virus because it is take, it's taking so many lives, costing the country so much. So whatever we can do to cooperate and get rid of this virus, I think we should try. I am 101. The, the health care requires it. And as a Christian, I am supposed to uphold the integrity of the law. I have no problem. I have no problem. I come by faith. By faith. Faith is a victory. Better to be saved than to be sorry. There's nothing we to be afraid of, and there's nothing to scare, to scare you. I feel all right, and I think everybody should take it. I think it's very essential to take the vaccine. With this virus, it's very essential. I already took mine and I had no problem, no pain. To what the medical system said it's very important. I think prevent is better than cure. I don't want to catch it and I don't want to give it. At this point in time I'm feeling okay. I didn't have any fear. I've encouraged people to come and take it, the vaccine. People I come in contact with said they're not interested because they don't know enough about it. I encourage them to come and take it because I think it's important. We have to institute even stronger measures. It is clear that the level of compliance is not going to be achieved by virtue of moral suasion or appealing to the public. As a result, Jamaicans must brace for tighter COVID-19 measures, including three weekends of lockdown to include the Easter holiday. On March 26, April 1 and April 9, all workplaces and businesses except for those in the essential services will close at noon. Lockdown will be in place for Good Friday on April 2, lifting at 5 a.m. the following day. On April 3, curfew starts at noon and continues all day Easter Sunday and Monday, ending at 5 a.m. on Tuesday, April 6. The nightly curfew will revert to the 8 p.m. to 5 a.m. hours on April 6 to April 10. On Saturday, April 10, the weekend lockdown starts at midday, continues all day Sunday, lifting at 5 a.m. on April 12. Those measures, uh, we believe, will significantly reduce the infection rate, will reduce our, what they call the, the r not, the reproductive rate, and bring our hospitalizations down and relieve the stress on our health system. For health's sake, abide by the COVID-19 protocols.
Despite all that's happening with the pandemic, we give thanks and nature seems to be doing so too. As we'll see in our next feature, during this, the holiest period of the Christian calendar, the poi plant is coming into bloom, exhibiting nature's grandeur. Take a look. They may bloom white, pink and most definitely yellow flowers. They can be seen from near and far. Bees love them, birds adore them, and humans can't get enough of them. They need no introduction. After all, they're picture perfect. That's the poi. Jamaica is known as the land of wood and water. Its beauty is world renowned. Adding to that notoriety is the poi plant. Poi or tabibuya, as it is called, is a tropical plant that's native to the Caribbean. South and Central America. It's also known as tree of old or trumpet tree for its showy inflorescence. Poe come in three brilliant shades, white, pink, and yellow. The white poe is a rare find. The pink variant is the national flower of El Salvador and Paraguay, while the yellow poe is a Jamaican favorite. This broad-leaved perennial plant is a popular forest tree on the island. Trees can grow up to 150 feet tall, with a trunk averaging a foot in width. The yellow poi is the shortest of the family, followed by the pink strain with the white poi reaching the highest heights. The poi can be pruned to a desired height, so don't be surprised if you see some short trees around. In the rainy season, the tree is usually evergreen and unassuming. By the dry season, its deciduous nature appears. But that's when the magic happens. The leaves give away the bright bursts of yellow, pink and white clusters of flowers that blanket the tree and later carpet the ground. The large tubular-shaped corolla forms a collection of blossoms which group together to strike a fashionable pose. As blossoms scatter below, new fruit and foliage develop. The fruits of the poi tree are long slender capsules which split at maturity, exposing their winged seeds, perfect for dispersal. Though planted mostly as a brilliant showpiece, the poi may be used as a timber tree. Its durability, density, resistance to termites and general decay make it a hardy wood in the building and construction industry. Certain species of poi are also grown as honey plants by beekeepers. The tree also serves another purpose, a study reminder for students at the University of the West Indies Mona campus. Legend has it that if students have not begun to study for final exams by the time the poi blooms, then they are sure to fail. The next time you venture outside, be sure to be on the lookout for the poi and feast your eyes on one of nature's most conspicuous beauties. Or better yet, contact the forestry department to get a hold of your very own poi plant. It only takes two to three years to give you a spectacular flower display. We've come to the end of another wonderful journey. Thanks so much for your company. Be sure to join us again tomorrow for another show. Until then, continue to watch these and other programs by logging on to our website, gis.gov.jm, or subscribing to our YouTube channel. You can also find us on all the major social media platforms and through our mobile app that's Android and iOS compatible. On behalf of the entire team here at the GIS, I'm Adrian Atkinson. Until next time, do take care. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.